they say the sharks of French Polynesia are happy and well fed. Guess I'm about to find out. Welcome back to another week of uh, this webinar called I Was Just Thinking. I'm Rudy Maxa, and in the other part of the screen, you see my first guest, Robert Niles, who happens to be an amusement park expert. We're going to talk to him about uh, the state of amusement parks, not just here, but in the world. You may have seen the, an article uh, this past week about uh, Disney, uh, Tokyo Disneyland and Hong Kong, or, uh, Chinese, uh, Disneyland in China, I guess, where people are, guests are forbidden to scream while on a roller coaster for fear of spreading COVID and people aren't happy about that. We're gonna talk to you about that and, and what's happening with the Disney empire here in the United States. And then at the half hour, we're going to invite the uh, actor, Robert uh, Woolen, W-U-H-L. You may know him as the guy who created and starred in the uh, sitcom uh, Our List in which he played a um, moralist, uh, no, I guess immoral would be the word, immoral sports agent. He also was the reporter in the first Batman movie, as I recall. Uh, we're going to talk about him, about his places of the heart and what it's like traveling as an actor and so on. Uh, but first, um, I, as I always do, I want to start with a, a glass of wine. Uh, Robert, did you bring your wine by any chance? Uh, I'm in California. That's illegal here now. Everything's illegal in California. <laughs> I probably also forgot to invite you. This is an interesting bottle. We've had some, we do some Burgundy, we do some Bordeaux, we do some Champagne. This is from that great wine growing state of Wisconsin. So here's the deal. I was in Wisconsin last week at a friend's cabin on a lake, which is very thing you do up here in the upper Midwest. I'm broadcasting from my home in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, it's from a, a winery called Wollersheim, Wollersheim Winery. It's a dry Riesling, year 2018. There's a picture of the winery. Uh, it's about 10.5% alcohol, which is pretty low. Those big Napa cabs can be 13, 14%. Very inexpensive, about $10, as befits a Wisconsin wine. Um, and But here's the story I want to tell you about it. I'm going to tease you a little bit. The vines at this winery were first planted in the 1840s by a Hungarian nobleman. I've got to read his name again. Augustin Herazathi. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him in just a moment. There's a picture of him. Um, he is considered the father of the California wine industry, believe it or not. But he started in Wisconsin in uh, the 1840s. Um, in 1872, excuse me, 1972, sorry, uh, the Wollersham family came in and took this winery over, well, took what used to be the land that the winery was on over. Um, at one point, after the Hungarian guy started it, um, along came uh, prohibition and um, and also phylloxera. So he sort of gave up. Um, and the Wollersham family bought it about 25 years ago, brought in a fancy French winemaker. And I'll tell you about the wine and I'll taste it in just a moment. But I want to tell you about this guy, this Augustine. Nine years after starting this winery, which is 20 years before the Civil War, um, he nurtured a village around it, uh, created the winery with vines he brought over from Europe. And then he heard about the gold rush in California. So he decided to go out there, but he didn't go out for the gold. Uh, he, he led a wagon train. He was elected captain of a wagon train uh, headed towards San Diego um, on the Santa Fe Trail. He said he wanted to start a winery near San Diego. Turns out the climate wasn't great, but this guy was a really busy guy. Turns out he planted orchards. orchards. He operated a livery stable and a stagecoach line. He opened a butcher shop. He became a real estate developer, subdividing a large section of San Diego Bay into an entire community. He was elected sheriff of the San Diego County. He built a city jail. He was elected to the California State Assembly, where his efforts to divide California into two states did not work. Robert, you could be living in one state, and you're up. You're Northern California, right? Southern. Southern. You're Southern. Okay. Well, you, your Northern would be another state if he had gotten his way with it. Then he was elected to the California State Assembly. As I mentioned, he began buying land around San Francisco and Sonoma, and he imported vines from Europe once again, and he started Buena Vista Vineyard, which is, still exists. And I think the building that is there is his original home. You can visit it. It's a great stone structure, as I remember. It's been years since I went to the Buena Vista winery, but they make good wines in Sonoma. 
He also hired a guy named Charles Krug as his winemaker. And if you know Champagne, Charles Krug is a really big name. So he clearly went on to do well himself. Uh, um, uh, Augustin wrote his first book on European winemaking techniques in California, which earned him that moniker of the father of modern California winemaking. And as if that wasn't enough, he grew a little bored there. So he went to Nicaragua with a buddy to start a sugar plantation so he could make rum. And this was about three years after the Civil War. That worked fine until about a year. He fell into a river near his, uh, near his uh, sugar plantation. It's an alligator infested river. Nobody ever saw Augustine again. They don't know whether he was swept out to the sea or whether the alligators ate him. But is that a story? So that's how this winery started. And along came the Wolfersheims, uh, Bob and Joanne Wolfersheim. By the way, I haven't talked to him. I didn't visit the winery when I was in uh, when I was in Wisconsin the other day, and I haven't tasted it. They conveniently put on a screw top, which I like. Thank you, Joanne and Bob. I'll taste it, and then we're going to get right to Robert. Robert, I'll let you know how it compares to your that California stuff you call wine out there. I'm sure. Now, okay, so this is a dry riesling, and last night I had a very good German riesling, so I'm putting it up against taste buds that have uh, were spoiled last night. Very nice nose, pretty color, nice and gold, very reasonable. Let's see. It's a big reason. This is uh, what California Burgundies are to Burgundies from Burgundy, bigger. Um, it's definitely dry, but a little sweeter than, than, than a dry Riesling from Germany, but it's very good. It's quite good. Austin knew what he was doing. Uh, this is a, uh, they make about nine different wines at the, at, at the winery. They make a rosé, they make something, uh, they make all kinds of stuff. But I think this is probably their purest one. They, they have found grapes at, uh, which happens in Minnesota too, where I live. Um, the agriculture departments at the universities are constantly uh, trying to breed different kinds of grape vines that can stand up to cold weather. Okay, enough about wine. Let's talk to Robert uh, about, um, um, amusement parks and theme parks. And you are welcome to join in by asking questions at the bottom of that box on the right. Delighted to have you here today, um, all of you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dennis. Nice to see you. Where are my granddaughters in France? They're not in there yet. All right, Robert, how did you, first of all, were you a kid who loved theme parks? Of course, absolutely loved them. I'm a Southern California native, but born in Los Angeles. So I was hauled off to Disneyland. Um, Actually, I was hauled off to Disneyland while, you know, before I was even born. Um, my mom got kicked off Pirates of the Caribbean for being pregnant. Uh, that's the first Disneyland story that I've ever been told. Uh, but uh, yeah, I loved them as a kid. Uh, we took lots of road trips around the country uh, when, when I was a kid too and visited a lot of theme parks. And I worked at Disney World while I was in college. No, so, what um, did you do there? Yeah, I was a Pirate of the Caribbean and a Tom Sawyer Island raft driver. So. How long um, was, was it fun? Right. Was it was it? Oh, it's great! It's a blast. Really? It's a blast. Um, in it is. Uh, it really is. I mean, your job is somebody else's vacation, and it's just a. It's a great joy to be down there. I mean, obviously, you. It, it all depends on the attitude that you bring to it. I really enjoyed uh, talking with people from all around the world. I, I. A lot of my friends in college, uh, yeah, they went off and they did gap years. They went to Europe. They started jobs all over the place. And I just decided I was going to take a year between uh, college and grad school and just work at Disney World. And that was kind of my gap year. So you were, and it you was were wonderful. Cast, because, isn't that what you guys were called? Cast yeah, cast member. But, but you actually, you meet people from all around the world. It's like taking a world trip and getting paid for it. Uh, the people from, from, from South America, from Europe, from Asia, Africa, Australia, everywhere imaginable, uh, you run into those people if you're working at the Walt Disney World Resort. And it was just a phenomenal experience that I, I, I cherish to this day. Did you imagine that your career might revolve around theme parks? I mean, what you were in high school? What did you think you were going to be in high school? Do you have no, any no idea? Uh, I, well, in high school, I had no, I, I had no clue. I was just I was, simply, I, I went to high school in Indianapolis, and I was simply just trying to get out, and go back to a big city again because I, I was high from or college. College. Well, oh, college. I went to Northwestern in Chicago. Oh, oh, and um, yeah. uh, and uh, so so I was spending winters in Chicago and summers in Florida, which is the exact opposite of the way you should be doing it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, that was bad. Right. Uh, but I, I could I can handle extreme weather now. Um, but uh, 
but yeah, I, I, I decided I wanted to go into journalism for some silly reason. So I went to, uh, I was going to go do graduate school in journalism and I was going to work in newspapers. And you could have uh, somewhere along that, Robert, I could have dissuaded you. You know what I mean? <laughs> somewhere along the line, I, um, yeah, I decided to just kind of start a website about theme parks on the side. And uh, eventually that turned out to be a better business decision than working in newspapers. Right. Uh, so that's, that's where I am now. And and when did you begin um, Theme Park Insider, which is your website, your blog? It is it is actually I just looked this up. It is twenty years ago this month. So we're going to be celebrating yeah. our twentieth anniversary at the end of the month. So is that an income source for you, or just a labor of love? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, it's it's my full time job at this point. Full time, uh, covering theme parks around the world, and literally around the world. Do they have theme mm -hmm. parks in South America? Excuse me. Do they have theme parks in South America? Not really particularly big ones. I mean, that's why you see the entirety of uh, you know South America coming up to Florida every summer. Uh, it seems right. like. Not that summer, of course, but uh, yeah, the entire nation of Brazil seems to be camped out at Walt Disney World in July. Well, most Julys, but uh, there are a few parks, there are parks everywhere. This is obviously Robert's uh, website here, and you can see some of the topics, obviously, about the opening and closing of various Disney properties. Um, so now what's... Uh, didn't somebody, didn't Hong, Hong Kong just close again? Yeah. Um, on uh, the 15th, we had uh, the last two Disney par uh, Disney World parks reopened, Disneyland Paris parks reopened, but Hong Kong Disneyland closed back down. They had been open for about a month, but uh, the government in Hong Kong decided that the, the case trend wasn't the direction they were looking at. So they said that they're going to temporarily close down all the theme parks in the country. So that affects Ocean Park in Hong Kong as well, which is about the same size as Hong Kong Disneyland. I don't know if you've heard the news yet this morning because you're two hours behind me, but uh, uh, France declared that everybody now must wear masks as of this morning when mm -hmm. outside in France. And I guess that would apply to uh, Paris Disneyland as well. Yeah, that had been actually their, uh, the, the rule that Disney is implementing at their parks worldwide is that everybody has to wear masks. But, you know, if uh, if the government is actually a requirement, I mean, speaking as a former cast member, it is a lot easier if you can come up to someone and say, you need to do this, not just because it's our rule, but because it's a law uh, that uh, that puts a little heft behind the enforcement, uh, which should hopefully make it a little bit easier for cast members in uh, Disneyland Paris to uh, to to enforce that rule. Although French people, you know, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. You know, the, the cast at Disneyland Paris is a little bit different than the cast at uh, Disney's other theme parks around the world. It's interesting to see the cultural differences because you've got that Disney theme park experience, which is kind of the constant holding everything together, but you can still see the cultural differences between, you know, even, even Anaheim and Florida, I think there's a little bit of a difference between Paris and Tokyo. Absolutely, you can see huge difference. I mean, if you want the world's best service, go to Tokyo Disneyland. That's amazing. Or anywhere in Japan, pretty much. True, right? true. Uh, do you have children, Robert? Yes, I do. Um, well, they, they are yeah, grown. Yeah. But, uh, Actually, they're grown. They are grown, but yeah, well, they were, I'm sure you took them to theme parks. Have you been running that website for 20 years? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they, tell funny, in the world? they tell funny stories about going to Disneyland with their friends and realizing, oh, we don't have to run all over the place and take pictures. We can just relax and have fun. I, we had no idea. Uh, they're very jaded about theme parks at this point. Although my daughter does occasionally write stories for our site. So um, they, they've been involved, and my son edits videos for us sometimes. So they've been involved in the family business. But uh, yeah, they're definitely um, not your typical theme park consumers. Yeah, it must have been great being your kids. <laughs> well, they 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 also absolutely hate it when people ask, so what does your dad do for a living? And they're just like, this is the question they hate whenever they meet new friends. It's oh. just like, um, well, he rides roller coasters professionally, and they're like, okay, stop lying. Just tell right, me the right. truth. I'm like, no, well, seriously, that's what he does for a living. Fortunately, I'm in LA where uh, you know everybody does something weird for a living, so I kind of blend in here. But uh, it's still uh, it's still a bit unusual. Yeah, you're just doing that till till you get your acting gig going together, right? <laughs> right. I've got a script. Right. So, how many, leaving aside COVID nineteen era, how many theme parks might you visit in a year? Oh, probably a couple of dozen in the course of the year. I mean, obviously, we focus primarily on the parks in Central Florida and Southern California because those are the popular ones. Those 
Uh, but every couple of years ago, we'll do a national trip. Uh, we'll do a cross-country road trip in North America and hit up some of the regional parts. So, you know, uh, the lineup changes from year to year, but I do try and get to a you know, couple dozen parks a year or so. And um, I suppose it's like asking about your favorite child. Have you at different points, points in your life and in your career had favorite places? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I mentioned Tokyo Disney before, and that's one of my favorite places to go. I absolutely love that. I love Universal Orlando in the United States. I love my home park of Disneyland. Um, I love, uh, there's this great park in the Netherlands called Efteling, which I absolutely adore. It's based on a lot of uh, European fairy tales. And What's it's it just Efteling. How do you spell that? E E F T E L I N G. It's actually one of the larger theme parks in Europe. It's um, kind of in the southern, well, kind of the middle part of the Netherlands. It's not something you would run into unless you were looking for it. Um, there's another great park in uh, Indiana in the town called Santa Claus, called Holiday World. That's another one that kind of reminds me of that. It's a family run park. Uh, you'll never run into it unless you go looking for it. But if you go looking for it, you'll find a lot of other theme parks fans there. Is it, and, is it year, year, open year round? Open year round? Uh, definitely in those open year rounds. Um, uh, holiday world is just summers only, which is I a see. little unusual that they're not open for the holidays being holiday world, but such is the weather in Southern Indiana. Have you ever written anything that has caused the theme park to change a policy or a direction? I don't know that they would admit. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we've written about things that were, um, you know, kind of operational challenges for parks, but it's not like I was the only one who recognized that. I think, uh, you know, parks themselves know when they have operational challenges. I mean, the classic example of a, of a theme park that uh, changed direction would be Disney California Adventure in, uh, in Southern California. Uh, when it opened, it opened to a collective yawn. Uh, the attendance just wasn't that great. And over time, Disney realized they needed to do something with the park. And they completely redesigned it, rehaul, uh, revamped the entire front entrance of the park, added a big new cars land, took it in a different direction. And it's been a wonderful success for them ever since. And they've been trying to do something similar with Hong Kong Disneyland, uh, just kind of upping that park with some new themed areas. They're in a, almost complete with uh, a complete rebuild of the castle there. But uh, obviously situations in Hong Kong just politically and then with the COVID situation have yeah. uh, kept them from seeing any real attendance gains with that. But uh, you know, you, clearly parks, parks make improvements when they see the need. Have you been to Disneyland in your backyard since uh, it reopened with a limited crowd, limited capacity? Well, um, Southern California, none of the parks have reopened here yet. Uh, Disney oh, World, me, was, Orlando, I'm sorry. Disney right. World in Orlando has reopened. Right. I, actually, it's curious, Knott's Berry Farm has found a loophole and they're opening this weekend. They're doing it as a um, outdoor food festival because they realized that outdoor dining was legal in California, but not mm -hmm. theme parks. So they're doing a thing where they're just setting up the food stands they would have had for one of their food festivals. And uh, you can come on into the park and, you know, buy the food. None of the rides are operating, none of the shows are operating, but they can at least get people in the park this way. So that's kind of interesting. That'll be the first theme park that's really opened in any way in Southern California so far. Did you say the shows are operating? No, are shows are not operating. operating. Okay. okay. Um, they actually, they, they might have, they have a little cowboy band that was playing out in their California marketplace uh, for people when that when um, indoor dining was open for a hot minute in California. Uh, so maybe they might have some strolling musicians running around, but you know, it's not, they're not gonna have any of their big theater shows going on. And am I, uh, I you're right, Orlando is open. Am I correct that Los Angeles, well, Anaheim uh, was about to open this month? And, and had yeah, they, they had actually announced that they were gonna open on uh, July 17th, which is their 65th anniversary, Disneyland. The Disneyland it's tomorrow. Was uh, which was tomorrow. They were supposed to be open, uh, but they hadn't gotten state approval for it yet. I think they thought it was a technicality because everything was really headed in that direction. And then the approval didn't come and then it didn't come. And then finally they said, not only are we not approving theme parks to reopen, we're actually going to begin rolling back some of the things that we had open, such as in-person dining and bars and movie theaters um, in some counties. So the direction in California is closing down, not reopening. So we have no idea when it will be before you can go back to Disneyland again. Oh, big financial hit, isn't it? 
Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, theme parks have always been the cash cow for the Disney company. You think about all the things that they do with, with uh, just dominating film at the box office, all the TV that they've got, uh, ESPN, ABC. Uh, they make an enormous amount of money, but it's always been theme parks have been right up there with one of the top uh, revenue draws for the company. Uh, it actually it's looking really good that you know Bob Iger made the decision to open a streaming service in the beginning of you know in late 2019 because I think Disney Plus has saved their bacon during the uh, during the closure time. But uh, still, it's obviously a huge financial hit for the company. And even with Walt Disney World reopening at this point, it's with sharply limited capacity. And uh, you know, there's no international tourism. There's very little state to state tourism. You're dealing with with basically just relying on Florida locals and Frankly, a lot of Florida locals know better than to go to theme parks in the middle of the summer in Central Florida. It's just way too hot. Well, here's the question for you, and I'm interested in your answer on this. It's from Cheryl. She wants to know what your opinion of Tivoli Park is, or Tivoli Gardens in Copenhagen. That is one of the top parks on my, I've got to go do that list that I have not been to yet. You haven't been to so Tivoli? I have not been to yeah. Tivoli. I, it's, I, I'm embarrassed. I'm sorry. I have to admit it. But um, that really is when you talk about the place that started the theme park industry. I mean, a lot of people talk about Disneyland. Uh, Walt Disney admits, I mean, he was inspired by Tivoli. I mean, that's that's really the true birthplace of the themed entertainment industry. I I, I was out in Europe a couple of a uh, couple of years ago, and I it just I, I had to cut it from the itinerary. Just couldn't get to it. So I'm I'm itching to get back there. So it just it. It's just so frustrating that I can't get to Europe at this point because that's one of the places I wanted to be this year. I think you'd be quite impressed. Yeah, I, I've heard so many things from people I know and respect in this industry who just speak so highly of it. Have you, uh, and I'm going to have to duck my head now because I think I used one of these books to prop up, the, the book, one of one of my books propping up this laptop here is is the Disney book by uh, Dis called Disney's Land by Richard Snow. Mm -hmm. Have you read that book? Um, like, I would I recommend that. You read it yeah, okay. a person, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so much wonderful, uh, uh, you know, wonderful library about the history of the Walt Disney Company, Walt himself, and um, the development of the theme parks. One that one that I just finished actually was uh, done, uh, written by Don Iwerks about his uh, father, uh, Ub, who was basically the guy who co-created Mickey Mouse. Uh, known as an animator, but he actually invented a lot of the stuff that you see in theme parks, such as uh, the Circle Vision theaters, a lot of the, kind of the green screen technology that's used to this day in motion right. pictures. Right. Uh, a lot of the tech stuff was was developed by by this guy who uh, helped create Mickey Mouse with Walt Disney. So it is it is amazing. And one of the nice things about uh, this little pause that we have that's keeping us from traveling is it's an opportunity to catch up with the reading and learn more about the history of the destinations and attractions that we love so much. Well, I think you'd like Disney's Land. It's a relatively new book. I think it came out about six months ago. Oh, okay. You Put it on the list. Author must be very confident about it because yeah. I couldn't get him on my radio show, couldn't get him on the webcast. He doesn't do any publicity, which is very rare for an author. Okay, yes, that is. Um, absolutely understand that. All right, Dennis wants to know if you visited Kennywood Park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, swing by for a really quick trip once. Uh, really, not, That's another one of those really nice family-owned parks. They put out a great coaster last year uh, called Steel, Steel Curtain, uh, themed to the Pittsburgh Steelers. It's actually one of the first sports-themed uh, attractions that we've seen in the country. And they're, they were gonna build up a big kind of Steelers country land around that. I don't know how much of the work they got done on it. Uh, but that's another one of those great uh, road trip destinations if you're putting together a cross country trip and wanna hit up a lot of theme parks, that's definitely one to hit. Did there used to be a lot more of these family run smaller parks than there are now or? <sighs> they kind of come and go. I think they, I think they, you know, Disney and Six Flags and all the big chains kind of, um, they kind of suck up all the oxygen in the room, really. They get a lot of the attention, uh, particularly the way that they're all structuring tickets now. Like with Six Flags, if you buy an annual pass with one park, you basically get them all. Uh, so if you're going on a cross-country trip and you've got Six Flags pass, that's going to encourage you to go to Six Flags parks because, you know, you've already gotten a ticket into them. Um, and that kind of hurts some of the family parks like Holiday World and and, and Kennywood and uh, Hershey Park in Pennsylvania, not specifically family-owned, but it's an independent park. Uh, they're not bundled into the chains like others. So uh, 
you know, everybody's kind of paying as they go with them. And, um, but I, you know, on Theme Park Insider, we like to give them attention. We like to draw people to, to these parks too, because there's some wonderful experiences to be had at them. And, and you cer certainly shouldn't be overlooking them just because they're not part of the chain. Good point. My guest is Robert Niles. He is the creator and curator of themeparkinsider.com. It's a website that's been up for 20 years and he's a theme park uh, um, expert, obviously. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to talk with the uh, actor Robert Wool about his favorite places in the world and his new project with uh, with this new technology called, I think it's called Kibo, Kibi, and this, well, these short little bursts of drama that you can eat like M&Ms, apparently. Um, the uh, Cheryl brings up Disney, the Disney's museum. Is that the is that in San Francisco? I, I'm yeah, so... uh, the Presidio in San Francisco, the yeah, Walt Disney, Disney Museum, the, the museum. former military yeah. base. Right. Yeah, that was that was done by the family, not the company. Uh, so right. it's very much a focus on on Walt uh, Walt the man and his creative process. They've got some wonderful exhibits up there. That book I just mentioned by uh, Don Iwerks, that was actually uh, written for the museum itself. Um, basically as a guide to a lot of the exhibits they had up there about uh, the early development of the Walt Disney theme parks. So uh, absolutely, that's another one of those places. You know, if We talk about the theme park industry, but it's really kind of a themed entertainment industry at this point. Uh, people sure. are designing museums, shopping areas. Um, so places like the Walt Disney Family Museum are a wonderful place for a theme park fan to go that you might not necessarily think of because they don't have rides. But uh, if you're into the stories, it is just amazing what you can find at a facility like that. What's Club 33 at Disneyland? Ruth just asked if you've been there. Is that the private club? Uh, that is the private club. That is Walt Disney's private club that was built up above uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. They actually moved it a few years ago across the street, but it's up so they could expand it. And Correct. they're actually doing Club 33's at Walt Disney World now too, but it's a, it's a private members only club um, that you have to uh, spend a ginormous amount of money to join. I don't even know that you can get in at this point. The wait list is so long. I personally have not been in uh, before. Uh, I have not been invited by a member, but uh, uh, it's wonderful. The, the appeal of it for the longest time was that was the only place you could get alcohol inside Disneyland. They didn't mm -hmm. sell it in the park until last year when Star Wars Galaxy's Edge opened and they opened the Star Wars Cantina there. Uh, so for the longest time, if you wanted alcohol at Disneyland, the only place you could get it was being a member of Club 33. So is it a dinner place, a place to hang? That yeah, it's just, it's just a big fancy restaurant, basically. I see. Okay. Hey, I, I, I'm petrified of roller coasters and always let my kids go on them while I watched and feared for their lives. You like roller coasters? No. Yeah, like I said, I ride roller coasters professionally. So they're absolutely and You really get on them and ride them. Yeah, absolutely. We get uh, if you go on to our YouTube page, there's uh, lots of video of me riding roller coasters, talking about them while I'm riding. So, oh, <laughs> I mean, speaking of screaming on a roller coaster, which is what I've done a few times, mm -hmm. I've been cajoled into getting on one. Um, people in Asia aren't real happy that they can't scream on these roller coasters, are they? Yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of one of the things they're trying to try and to prevent the uh, spread of COVID. Obviously, you don't want any part of anything coming out of an infected person's mouth. So you could put a, mask. put a mask over them. But, uh, you know, honestly, part of this is also a little bit of a PR game, too, telling people that they can't scream on roller coaster. That's going to get a little attention for the parks because it sounds so absurd. Uh, frankly, I, I almost never scream on roller coasters. I think there's two types. I mean, there are people who are screamers and then there are people who are just like, eh. And uh, you know, if anything, I trend, tend toward the other. So I had to kind of train myself to do all these videos and stuff. But uh, there's some people who just love putting their arms up and screaming and just being out there with the whole thing. And uh, some people just kind of turtle up. So it's interesting to see that uh, range of reactions to uh, coasters. Yeah, do you have a couple of favorite roller coasters in the world right now? I mean, or in, um, the, United, in the United States, let's put it that way. Honestly, the one I absolutely adore right now uh, doesn't feel like a traditional coaster so much. It's Hagrid's Magical Creatures Motorbike Adventure at uh, Islands of Adventure at Universal Orlando. It's a Harry Potter themed coaster. They've got nine launches on it, but a bunch of show scenes as well. It's absolutely wonderful blend of kind of a dark ride and a roller coaster thrill. So that's my favorite one right now. I also love Steel Vengeance at uh, Cedar Point in Ohio for just pure thrills. That's an absolutely wonderful coaster if you're really looking for that big coaster experience. Well, Robert Niles is a man who knows his theme parks. Robert, I know you'll keep an eye on it. His website is Theme Park Insider. If you're a theme park devotee, you've got to check that out and he'll keep you up to date on what's going on not only here, but also worldwide. 
Thank you so much for taking time out of your day, Robert, and chatting with us. Thanks for having me. It's been a joy. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. And popped up in the corner, flossing his teeth right now. <laughs> Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Is Robert Wool. You know him from his series that he both created and starred in Arliss. Uh, you may also remember him as the uh, reporter in Batman. And uh, he's going to talk about a new... Uh, <laughs> Robert, I, I, I asked about your new work and you texted me uh, Quito, which happens to be the capital of Ecuador. Uh, you're actually in a new series on Quibi. Quibi, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, we got that. Um, but before we start talking, uh, we want to we want to run a uh, we want to run the trailer for Arliss. Uh, um, remind people of that delightful uh, bad boy you played as a sports agent. Can you run that uh, for us, uh, Michael? We're a boutique agency, and I'll always be there for him, and not just through the good times, through the bad too. Michael Irvin on line four. I'm not here. We represent professional athletes here. I work with great people, and I have the respect and the appreciation of my clients. We take care of a client's individual needs. If there's anything I've learned after 20 years of getting involved with clients' personal lives, it's don't get involved with clients' personal lives. In 25 years of business, AMM has always shown a profit, and that is not going to stop now. Honest, you're depraved. You make it sound like a bad thing. My clients know that stars wouldn't be stars without the help of those who make them shine. Where's Hollywood Squares? Where's my movie? You're a piece of... This isn't about money, Arliss. It's about ego. That is absolutely not untrue. Emotions have no cash value. You know, if I get you really drunk sometime, will you tell me what happened to you as a kid? Terrific. Oh, terrific, Robert. Uh, you missed playing that role. Was it fun? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. It was great. It was, you know, I created the show and I got to, uh, you know, write it and direct it. And uh, I got to uh, work with great actors and uh, meet a lot of interesting people. And the athletes were fun. No, I loved it. Plus, I could tell any story I wanted to tell. And I got into, especially as the series went on, we got into more social themes. Uh, I remember this is 20 years ago. We, would, we did shows about domestic abuse, steroid takers, gay athletes, transgender athletes, alcoholism, Alzheimer's, uh, unwanted pregnancies from ball players. Uh, you know, we got into a lot of, you know, a, a lot of good issues. Uh, so I really like that a lot. It's 20 years ago. This is uh, Robert. I'm, I just grew older in the two minutes you were talking about it. I would have guessed eight, nine years ago, but I guess no, I'm no. as old as I am. So. Actually, we started in 96, so it's 24 to, to uh, 96 to 2002. Ah, ah, okay. Before we talk about travel, you you know this is a, a lightly based travel uh, uh, web, webinar, webcast. Um, you are doing a, you are one of the many. Big... I made a big mistake. You got to hold on for one second. Okay. I should have done this during the uh, clip. My wife would kill me. Hold on. What did you just uh, you you are watching uh, Robert uh, Wool W U Wool W U H L. You know him as an actor from uh, all kinds of things, and he's now in a new series on uh, Quibi um, with a lot of other big name actors. Um, what, what, were you, what did you need to change, Robert? The background. I turned this, the background. Uh, oh. I mean, there's a lot of crap going on on the other side that we're moving around. And I realized it was facing that way, so now I got a much prettier backdrop. You look great. You look great. All right. Well, let's let's talk about this Queeby thing before we talk about travel. Um, Queeby is this new, new, very well financed media company. The basis of which is we all have very short attention spans and short times. So these are dramas being done in in small bites. But apparently, yours is um, it's all being all you guys do this stuff at home or in your backyard. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happened was Jason Reitman went to uh, wanted to. Do something for charity for the World Hunger Organization. I think World Hung World Hunger Kitchen. World. Uh, it might be World Kitchen. It might be him. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And so he went to Jeffrey Katzenberg at Quibi and said, "Would uh, yeah, I'm thinking about doing a thing of the Princess Bride that everybody could just shoot at home, and we'll have multiple actors playing parts. And um, it's just a goof, uh, but it'll be the real script and the real, you know, and and." 
uh, if I can get stars, uh, it's, it's, can you give a million dollars to charity? And they said yes. And he's got Adam Sandler and uh, Charlize Theron and, oh, boy, who else is in this? And Hugh Jackman, Common, uh, Tiffany Haddish, Jack Black, Josh Gad. Uh, you. The, I'm in it. I play one. I play the, I'm one of the grandfathers. Interestingly enough, Rob Reiner reads the first, because you have multiple people. Every time it's a scene, it's a different person playing a character, same character. And uh, I'm playing one of the grandfathers who reads the book to his grandson in the, uh, uh, if you remember the Princess Bride, in, sure. in the book. And it's interesting because in the what Rob Reiner, who directed the original, uh, it's got uh, is reading to Freddie Savage, who played the kid uh, in the original. But the very last scene is where the they finish the book and the grandfather says, "Well, that's it." And the the, the grandson says, "Wow, I really enjoyed that." After not poo pooing it, he goes, "Could you read it again to me tomorrow?" And the grandfather says, uh, "As you wish," which was the catchphrase in the whole thing. How what's interesting is. For the last scene, um, which they shot only about two weeks ago, uh, Rob Reiner played the grandson in bed, and Carl Reiner played the grandfather, saying, as you wish. Oh. He died maybe a week later. Oh, Carl Reiner. Oh, my goodness. Well, so you can you download this. This is an app you can download for your smartphone, and it's spelled Q-U-I-B-I, right? Right. And it's five minutes. I mean, everybody and their brothers in this thing. It's quite right. Javier Bardeen. Uh, oh, I, you know, I, I'm the low man on the totem pole here. Uh, it's quite remarkable and it's fun. And by the way, you literally could phone it in. I literally. mean, you literally phoned it in. You know, you, right. shot, so, you shot yeah. it on your iPhone and, and, and you phoned it in. It was great. Yeah, I, I want to, uh, I want to reemphasize that every scene. For this, how many how many scenes are there? I haven't watched the whole. I have no idea. Well, every scene has been shot in the actor or actress's home or backyard, and yeah. in a couple of cases or driveway, mm -hmm. and uh, so it's very by by themselves, very cleverly uh, put together. All right, let's talk travel a bit. What you you grew up where? New Jersey. And when did you leave New Jersey? How, how, what did you do in between there and well, acting? I, I left after high school. I went to school in Texas. Um, uh, at Houston, and I crammed four years into seven there, and then <laughs> and then I came back and I started doing stand-up comedy in uh, New York, and I lived in Jersey City and for about two years, and I moved out to California in '79, and I've had a place here ever since. I've lived here now. I also have a place in Manhattan, but uh, my wife and I and I love traveling. I mean, that's I love traveling. Uh, that was great. To, I didn't mind being a stand-up comic on the road. I got to know all the good barbecue places and all the good places on the road. Right. People, I love you know traveling around the country, being a bit of a gypsy, and I love I love traveling. I love Europe. I haven't been. I, I've been to Europe a bunch, but uh, um, I, I you know I've been to Paris about. I don't know. I'd say about uh, 10, 12 times. Uh, and uh, I used to take, I'll show, I'll show you what I'm talking um, my, my, you know, we, you know, and we travel everywhere with our dogs. Unfortunately, my, see, here are my dogs in Paris. You can see you that. You traveled with your dogs to Paris? They, oh, went, they, were, there, they were there eight times. <laughs> eight no. times. Isn't oh, that, yeah. Robert, isn't that difficult? I don't have a dog, but isn't that difficult? Don't you have to get no, shot? No. No, nope. not Paris. Some places. The UK was difficult. The UK, yeah, the UK is difficult, right? Yeah, uh, but no, Paris. They were there eight times. They were in Italy two or three times. Uh, Paris. They spoke the language. They got to learn. They they were there so often. They would le wolf wolf zebawa. Yeah, um, and in Paris, dogs can sit at the table and order from the menu. I think. Yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So where else do you, have you been to Asia? No, I have not been to Asia. My wife's disabled, so it's it's kind of uh, we have to pick and choose our spots. Gotcha. And also the dogs, you know, I just lost a dog. So now when I finally can travel to places I haven't been before, I can't go anywhere. Uh, I, I actually wanted to use my frequent flyer miles finally to fly to, on Emirates Airlines because I love, oh. I read all about these great airlines, but not because they never would take the dogs. Uh, the dogs couldn't fly in the plane. So, uh, but now I can't do that either. I can't go anywhere. So no, no. we yeah, are. My last trip I took, out of the country was last, I was telling Michael um, that uh, I was in London last year for the Yankees Red Sox games. Uh, I took my, uh, my my two nephews and my goddaughter to London and that was fun. 
Nice. So if you if there was no COVID and, and we were still if we weren't on the don't invite them list of just about every country in the world right now, uh, it sounds like you might go to Paris. But am I right or wrong? If you could wave a magic. Oh, no, I plan on going to Italy this year. <laughs> and that got uh, 86 pretty quick. Uh, I was we were going to go to Italy and we were thinking about going down. See, I, we didn't have the we lost both dogs. So it was like um, we were going to go to Italy and then we were thinking about maybe going to like Casablanca, Spain, and then back up through France. Uh, I've always wanted to see Prague just for the architecture and everything. You see, my wife's disabled, so it's not that easy to travel with her. You know, I, uh, uh, so, but I always wanted to see Prague uh, just to look at it. Uh, you know, I've been to Budapest. I haven't been to, I haven't, I have not been to Asia at all. Um, and, uh, and I haven't been to South America at all. So, but but eventually we we make all these plans. And we say, yeah, let's just go to Paris. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> we go to France and Italy a lot. But my wife wants to go to Spain, so we'll see. Good, and you might want to add Portugal onto that list too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And when when you travel, do you stay in fancy hotels? Do you stay in B and B's? Do you? Oh, fancy hotel. That's yeah. right. I piss away money in hotels. That's my jokes. I, I have a car that's ten years old. So I'm not a car. I'm in California. I'm not a car person. I could care. I, I mean, it's just I have a 2006 or seven. What is it? 2000, maybe six, seven or eight uh, Lexus SUV. It's got 50,000 miles on it. That's it. Uh, I don't you care about LA. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, Amazing. I, but I don't travel much anywhere. So, I mean, we don't, I don't really have to go anywhere much. I drive down to San Diego to see uh, my relatives, occasionally to Santa Barbara to see relatives. But, I mean, I, I really don't go that many. If I go, I'm getting on a plane going somewhere usually. Um, but I don't care about cars. I do care about hotels. And I, I, I'm, I, a big, I'm a big hotel freak. I stay in Relais and Chateaus. I stay in great hotels. And because of my wife's disability and the fact that she, her and I, my schedule are totally different. She doesn't go to bed till like five in the morning. Five, oh, but she doesn't get up till like four in the afternoon. So right. we're on totally different schedules. So very, I have to get a suite wherever I go with a separate room so I can, you know, I can, you know, be up during the day. So, I mean, that's where I throw away money is, is uh, <laughs> on hotels. I love hotels. Listen, my father retired, well, he was an army colonel when I was a kid, would never stay. I mean, staying in a Howard Johnson on a turnpike was like checking into the George Sank in Paris for him. I got to do it twice. So my rebellion against the colonel has been the same thing. I like to stay in very good hotels. Do you uh, bring home, do you have a, a world-class collection from world-class hotels of shampoos and body lotions and shower gels? Just a few. I got to stop you back a second. Did you have to call your father the colonel? Yes. <laughs> Well, I didn't know. I, I refer to him to other people that way and still do. Well, I understand I've, that. I understand that part of it. Did you no, but I had, to answer the, I had to answer the phone this way. Colonel Max's court is ready. Max is speaking. May I help you please, sir? Mm -hmm. And I said to my father when I was six years old or whenever this right. started, I said, what if it's a woman on the other end of the line? Doesn't matter. May I help you please, sir? Really? Yeah. Yeah. My dad was military. Uh, well, he served in World War II. He wasn't lifetime military. He was a uh, Tinian, which was interesting because he was a code breaker. And of course, Tinian oh, yeah. was you know, where they flew the Anoka Day from. And his commanding officer was Paul Tibbetts. And he actually told me that he was a he was a cryptologist and he got a piece of a message that said little boy down. And he had no idea what it meant. He actually thought Eleanor Roosevelt was coming to visit. But uh no, little boy down was, you know, it was the bomb. So the bomb yeah. Uh, little was little boy one. Of the, I don't know which one was little boy. Was oh, Nagasaki I heard and a little boy with the two bomb names. But anyway, but I was just thinking about the colonel thing. That's interesting. Yeah, well, we could do a whole. That's a whole nother. I have no doubt of that. I you'd have no to build, you'd have to build me by the hour. Uh, yeah. So okay. So let's get back to hotels for a second. Yeah. So your your um, you know your rebellion is hotels. You said yeah, right? and and, rest, and good restaurants too because oh it, yeah, oh, it, yeah. It was it was eight dollars. You know, if it was that. Now, you know the thing about good restaurants. Here's the thing: my uh, my best friend in New York is a restaurateur named Drew Neporent, who I've known for. Yeah. You know Drew? Well, we're, I've met him many times. We're not okay. close friends. Well, we're, we're we're very close friends, and he owns Nobu and Tribeca and all those. And uh, but I, but during the pay, it's like I have got to learn in New York, especially that most of these restaurants and and the restaurant business is a tough business. I mean, their margins are so slim. But most of these restaurants really aren't worth, you're better off 
going to the really best restaurants than you are the notch below because you're spending, even though you're going to spend more at the best restaurant, you're better, in my opinion, going to one of those than going to the two or three of the other ones. I just, uh, you know, I don't drink. My wife makes up for it. So, um, but, I think you realize that stuff as you get older, Robert. Yeah. You know, like now I'd, I'd rather buy a really, uh, and this isn't an example, but a really nice shirt as yeah. opposed to five not nice shirts. Yeah, you learn, course, you learn where to channel that. I, I agree. Yeah. I mean, that uh, hotels, I feel, although hot, hotels, I feel the same way on. Uh, I, I, was, I was fortunate enough a couple of years ago, I did a pilot for the Travel Channel. And it was based on the book, A Thousand Places to See Before You Die. Now, we, we took the title, I mean, basically. And I got to go to Paris and you know, and, and do a, a tour. Of, well, it was my tour of Paris, which was a combination of tours and also history and a little bit of uh, – I'm a history guy, and I did these history specials on HBO or comedic. And I told stories about Paris that most people didn't know. Most people don't know about Paris. Most people don't know the Mona Lisa was stolen. Most people don't know that, yeah, it's stolen in the early 20th century. And in fact, one of the uh, suspects, the police suspected was Picasso because oh. they, well, he was, uh, yeah, they, he, they questioned him. Uh, most people don't know that when, when this Eiffel Tower first opened up, the French hated it. And it was supposed they, to come back down. Yeah, it was supposed to be torn down after. It was yeah. supposed to be torn down after the World's Fair. Right. And, and the only, and basically the, the biggest reason it stayed up was because of radio transmissions that they could use the tower for. Uh, in fact, Guy de Maupassant, the famous writer, hated it so much that he said he was going to eat lunch in the Eiffel Tower every day because it was the only spot in France he didn't have to look at. It. Oh, that is oh, that is so I mean, funny. Yeah I, mean, I, I, yeah, I mean, they hate I mean, so I got into that. And, of course, you know, I said I had my 65th birthday party in Paris. We had my wife's 60th. We had, and I, we always, and I always take a bunch of friends over with me. I'm a good friend to have. The, uh, I mean, I took over like 10 girlfriends of hers when she's turned 60. And, uh, and I, I, I get Paris. And of course, all the time, uh, I have to go. I turn everybody on to two places. Now, we talk about expensive restaurants, but you could eat pretty well in Paris without eating expensive. Oh, um, I hear you. Uh, if I would, to anybody who's watching this, if you go to Paris, two things. If you like hot chocolate, you must go to Angelina. Have you ever been to Angelina? No, and I spend a lot of time in person. I love hot chocolate. No, Angelina. Is it is it just a coffee shop or is it a restaurant? I'm shocked. I am shocked. It's, I'm shocked. Been, shocked. Been, right? it's been there. I mean, this was a place at Coco Chanel. It's a, it's a tea room. It's on the Rue de Rivoli, right wow. not, not far from the Louvre. It's right next to the um, Maurice Hotel. And this is one of the most famous hot chocolate in the world. I'm and gone. I'm, I'm there. Shocked. I'm shocked. I'm there. I turned everybody from all my friends to Glenn Fry of the Eagles to uh, to everybody out to this place. <clears throat> and um, I'm still there, Robert. No question. Where, what? All right. When you're not doing a movie and they're putting you in a particular hotel, is there one hotel that you? Yeah, I'm for these hotels. Oh, that one. That one was a deal because Peter Greenberg was a producer on it. So uh, we actually stayed at the uh, Peninsula, which was quite great. Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> Where do you and your wife like to stay? I prefer the left bank a lot. Um, I'm a left okay. bank. And so we, we used to stay at the Lutetia, which was the Grand Dame of the left bank. In fact, it's the hotel. It was actually built by the owners of the Beaumarchais department store, which was the first department store in the world. And about 20 years after it opened, they built the hotel so the customers had a place to stay, their clients. Now, that uh, I stayed there all the time. I must have stayed there five, six times. And then they just went through like a four or five-year remodeling, and uh, uh, which time I haven't stayed in it again. Now it's super pricey. Yep. But there was a little hotel where we honeymooned. And we stayed last time called L'Hotel, L apostrophe Hotel. I know it well. Yeah, and it's the place where Oscar Wilde died. And what did he say while he was dying? I'm dying beyond my means. And the other great line was, uh, I, was I'm paraphrasing. Uh, between, it's like, I am, I am locked in a battle with the wallpaper. One of us has to go. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, a very yeah. tiny hotel with very tiny rooms, but it's quite romantic. Perfect yeah. place for now, everybody. unless you get the now. When I was when we first got married for my honeymoon, we had a very tiny room. Right. This time I had the apartment on the top, which oh. is that has a terrace 
and you can eat outside. Unfortunately, what happened was when we were there, the elevator broke. My wife can't walk stairs. So they had to bring up every meal. They had to do everything. Uh, and they had one of these spiraling staircases, uh, which, which was, uh, but I love that hotel. I do love it. It's a very small, very, I, see, I love that area too. I love the left bank. You it's know? very funky. If you're listening right now and, and, and you might've missed the name of the hotel because it literally is L apostrophe hotel. I yeah. pronounce hotel in French. Right. So that's, that's what Robert's talking about. If you can get a room there, and can afford it. It's not, I mean, you know, it's not the Four Seasons. It's not Lutet. No, it's not. It's not. In the hotels. It's not, hotel. I can give you some great budget hotels because I brought, not budget, but lower price because I brought everybody when I had a party. So I had to put up like eight, ten right. people. And right, right by it is a, a hotel called, oh, what's the hotel in Paris? I really like this. I put everybody up in. I want to say, uh, so, the Hotel Saint Germain de Pre, I believe it is. De Pre, yeah, right. It's it's right. right around the corner from the hotel, and it's a terrific hotel with yeah. great prices. Um, uh, what's the other one? Another one? Uh, I want to say Le Angelique or something like that. Um, Angleterre. What's that? The Angleterre. L apostrophe A N G E L L E. That might be it. That um, might be it. the left bank. Yeah, it's on the left bank. Yeah, yeah, that could be it. That was a terrific hotel. It was another hotel, uh, the Spree de Saint Germain, which was a small hotel, independently owned, run by women, which was nice. Uh, I mean, I like, you know, I, I love hotels. I used to love the Lutetia because I love piano bars. I hang out at piano bars. So at night, like I said, I don't drink, but right. I can hang out at piano bars forever. And they had this great piano bar there and a great jazz lounge there, and I love that. So I look forward to doing that again. I, and as far as, you know, Paris restaurants, I mean, come on, you know, it's like. Well, well I, I want to ask. Do I go to bistros mostly. I don't, I, one or two, I, I've been to all the, see, I've been to the fancy, 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 uh, you know, the three-star Michelin restaurants, which, you know, are good. I find, again, I've eaten at a lot of them, just about all of them, and I'm a bistro guy. I, I mean, the thing about Paris restaurants, bistros, as you know, you can get one hell of a meal there for like thirty, forty dollars. Mm -hmm. I mean, and and the other, and that includes service. And the great thing about bistros, interesting, and I'm sure you know, is, is that if you do drink wine, with the exception of, you know, uh, Tour d'Argent and whatever, you know, the big stuff, let's say, you'll very rarely see a bottle of wine on a menu in France in a bistro. More than forty dollars, very rarely. Are you a Lamy Louis guy? You know, I've never eaten at Lamy Louis. I've never been there. Every well, my brother, who's who is a big foodie, and he's you know a Wall Street guy. He eats everywhere. He thinks it's. I mean, and and Drew likes it, but he, he says, listen, it's incredibly expensive for what you get. But you know, it's it's a piece of chicken. He goes, it's good. You get a ton of French fries. Yeah. And, and now, did you like Lamy Louis? Well, you know, yes, but it's very expensive, and the world's yeah. divided into probably 75% of people love Lemieux Williams, it's hard to get into, blah, 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 and the others who agree with a famous review that a British guy did that really trashed it, that went worldwide. Um, but the servings are enormous, enormous. Yeah. They, are, they are expensive. I, tell me if this is an intrusive question. You don't have to answer it, but why, the, why such a distinct difference in sleeping patterns between you and your wife? Well, I guess she's the one to say, why don't you go, why do you go to bed at five? Uh, well, I mean, my, she always has. She was always a night person. I met her actually when I was a stand-up comic at the Improv in New York. So, oh. although originally she was a school teacher, I mean, she was a teacher in Washington D.C. And she said one of the reasons she left is she hated the hours. Um, she's always been a night person, all mm -hmm. of my entire life. But that's um, a real night person, five in the morning. Yeah, I mean, five. She can get up at six too. I mean, you know, it's like so. I mean, um, she. That's just uh, that's just who she is. I mean, we have these weird schedules. Well, obviously, you've accommodated. You've accommodated. Okay, so now, have you spent time in Italy? You say that's where you would like to go, where yeah. you've been planning to go. Yeah. The last time we were in Italy, we did the Piedmont region, in which I really liked. It was a lot of Rolaise and chateaus down from uh, around the Milan area, down through Asti and those towns, and then to San Remo, and then we crossed into Nice. Um, I, Italy, Italy is just Italy. I mean, there's nothing like Italy. I mean, you got to work hard to get a bad meal in Italy. That's um, true. You really got to work hard. Uh, 
How, uh, where, where do you live in L? What neighborhood do you live in? Are you on the west side? I live in, in New York or LA. In LA. I live in Westwood. Yeah, so you can make it up to Nobu right up the coast there. That's good. I never go uh, to Nobu there. I never go to Nobu there. Never. Huh. I've been there once. Well, I won't tell Drew. Where do you live in New York? I live on the Upper East Side. Okay. All right. I go to Nobu in New York. Um, I might, you know, I don't, I, you know, it's interesting. I don't drive that much, so I don't want to schlep anywhere. Obviously. To, in, in, uh, you Obviously. know, I you don't don't drive get, a lot of play. You know, I get some takeout here, and uh, I cook. I mean, especially during this thing, I grill a lot. And, um, you know, here driving, I don't want to be in traffic. I, I just, I, you know, with rare exceptions, and of course, the food scene's gotten better. Well, I'm not, you know, like I, I was. The question is, in LA, see, New York, I can get out either. A, I take public transit a lot, mm -hmm. or up into an Uber, or you know, you get into a car or a taxi, and I can go anywhere in you know 20, 25 minutes. Here, I, I don't want to drive, and, and uh, I think well, everything everything's forty five minutes minimum in LA. You ought to come to San yeah, Paul. Not necessarily forty five, but I just yeah. come to San Paul, Minnesota, where I live, Robert. No, no problem with traffic. Let me tell you. Are you, I, I, are you I my life in DC in New York, so I'm not unfamiliar with traffic. I spend a lot of time in LA, not unfamiliar with traffic. But it's very funny to hear a guy, an actor who uh, successful actor, lives in LA and hates to drive and has only fifty thousand miles on a car that's really old. That's it's really amazing. The car's really big. Uh, and I really uh, also uh, now are you are you have you been to Target Field? Uh, yes, of course. Yeah, because I'm a, I'm a huge baseball fan. I have not yet been to Target Field. It's very nice, and I'm I, not. A, I hear I'm so. a fan, but it's very, very, it's a beautiful field. Yes. Yeah. Well, if you come, let me know and I'll take you to a good restaurant because I know where they all are here. Like that. So it didn't, didn't take me long to figure that out. Well, I, let me, we've only got about three or four minutes left. Um, I, I, I want to try to convince you to go to Asia at some point too. Oh, I and, like to go to Asia. And I think your wife could handle Hong Kong. I mean, it's very, you know, extremely modern. Singapore is uber modern. Mm -hmm. I mean, the problem, the problem is just the amount of time because she can't sit for very long. Ah, uh, that is a long flight. So we get, thank God for flatbed seats because I used to have to usually before they have flatbed seats, I had to buy out a row and coach for her so she would lift up the arms and lay down. And even right. that was comfortable because I had to fill in the cracks and everything. Uh, right. So that's difficult. Um, yeah, Asia. I, I'd like you know I'd, I'd like to go to Asia. Yeah, it's pretty darn good there too. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, how many miles you got? Uh, what airline do you have the most miles on? American Express. <laughs> the, oh, uh, good. Do you uh, keep count? I mean, do you keep track of those points and miles? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You play the game? Okay. I, I don't know if I play the game. I have a friend, uh, uh, Gary Leff. You know Gary Leff? Of course, yes. <laughs> Years ago, yeah, Gary Leff story. Years ago, I was planning a trip on going there, to- there, You should tell the audience, Gary Leff- uh, writes writes about frequent flyer miles and hotel points and how to collect them and how to gather them and how to use them widely. He's got a, a blog, et cetera. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Robert. Wait, I would say about, oh, God, at least 15 years ago, uh, I was planning a trip going to, going to Europe, and I had told Gary, and I, and I saw his ad about using frequent flyer miles. So I wrote to him and said, okay, here's what I need. I need two first-class tickets, lying flat, and by the way, we travel with two dogs in the cab. So we started, you know, communicating. And then he said, are you Robert Wall, the actor? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, let me throw something at you. <laughs> uh, he asked me, uh, by the way, this is a great thing to have. You from the wing, hotel guest. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not a normal uh, Gary Left post, but that is his website. Well, okay. so he said, "Are you the actor?" And you said, "Yes." Yeah. So I hosted the Freddie Awards, the frequent flyer oh. awards, for once or twice, and we've always been, for fifteen years we've been friendly. So, uh, so I usually let Gary, you know, take care of the stuff, and we become friends for fifteen years. Those guys know a lot about that. Those guys mm -hmm. know a lot about that, and I have a lot of friends. In fact, our producer, our, our producer for this webcast, who you know is a, has a has a, a website called Travel Zork on Las Vegas, but he's also a frequent traveler maven in that whole world. And I really turn it over to them. I just say, look, tell me. And they always, yeah. I think I know a lot about frequent flyer miles. No, there's the Freddie Awards site. Yeah. Boy, these guys, these guys know. Robert, it's a great pleasure having you on. I, I, I love your enthusiasm for Paris and for hotels and 
I'm glad I'm not the only one who was uh, probably disappointing his father and spending way too much money on hotels if you were here to see it. Travel safely with your wife. Thank you for joining us. Robert Wool is, uh, you can catch him now on Quibi in, uh, in The Princess Bride. And of course, no harm in watching Batman again or even watching his uh, old TV shows. All of them. So. Yeah, Arliss, Arliss is streaming on HBO. Yeah. Arliss is there and Arliss, look, it, it stands up 20 years later, believe me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm surprised how well it does. I thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, for, thanks so much, Robert. Very welcome. We'll be back next week. Join us then. We'll have a whole new roster of guests. And thanks for tuning in today. Bye-bye, Robert. Bye-bye, friends.